So uh, I'm curious, who here is at their first ever DrupalCon? Whoa, yeah. Now, anyone here their first time in France? Yeah. Uh, for me, it's, it's both. It's my first time at a DrupalCon EU, though I've been to the ones in North America. It's my first time in France. And uh, it's been an absolute trip of a week. So uh, I hope everyone else who's having those firsts are feeling the same way about their time here. Uh, so hello, uh, you're here hopefully to hear about our architecture decision records and our journey with them at Lullabot. Uh, and uh, if you don't know me, my name's Andrew Berry, and I'm the Director of Technology at Lullabot. Um, you can find me on drupal.community. And, uh, you know, as far as, like, other tech passions, I also love home automation, home assistance, ZigBee, TMQTT, all these different tools out there. And if you wish I was talking about those instead of ADRs, that's totally okay. You just got to find me after the session, and we can get together and nerd out. So... Uh, I want to frame this conversation with uh, this quote and just read it over, let it sit in your mind, and think about coming back to this as we, we walk through this journey. Um, do you remember 2021? I mean, yes and no. You know, it was uh, an interesting year for a variety of reasons. Um, at Lullabot, we had our, even though we're a distributed company, we all work from home wherever we may be in the States or in, I'm in Canada or, uh, you know, in the EU, um, you know, we had our first ever virtual retreat. And our CEO had a, a goal for us as a company. He wanted us to standardize and simplify our processes, our ways of working, our communication, all of these sorts of things. Um, but... What did that mean? I mean, these are two great words. You can put them in bold and they look good on a slide, but you can probably twist them into any goal you want. So we had to think about how we were going to approach this challenge that he had laid forth for the team. So when we talked amongst our, our, our leadership and our engineers and our developers and everyone on sort of the technical side, we thought about it in a couple of different ways. One was we knew that we wanted to improve knowledge transfer across project teams, that we saw that there were rough edges when uh, different teams sort of mixed who was within them and they didn't all have the same perceptions of the types of work that we should be delivering. Um, we definitely knew that we wanted to standardize and simplify the onboarding experience for new developers, whether that was someone who already worked at Lullabot, was joining a team where they hadn't happened to have worked with any of those people before, or when we hired at Lullabot. And there was this underlying sense that we were spending too much time solving the same problems over and over again that were functionally equivalent but just happened to be different at either, you know, a code or a user interface level or something like that. Um, so as we thought about these challenges, we thought, okay, well, let's observe and think about how our projects and how our teams are currently working today. Uh, and so, you know, in 2021, we had a, a couple of those, such as team members often were moving as a group between projects. So if you're not familiar with Lullabot, we're a digital Drupal agency, been around since, I don't know, 2006 or something like that. And the way I, our teams work is that, you know, you join a project, you work on the project, you hopefully finish the project, and then the team becomes free. And we can sell them for a new project. So it wasn't always happening this way, but often they ended up moving as a group from one project to the next with minimal change between those teams. Part of this is also because we fully dedicate our developers to a single project at a time, which meant that they weren't being exposed to different teams on a, on a daily basis unless they made an effort to expose themselves to the work that other teams were doing. And so what this meant was that we had lots of great best practices, but they were team-based, not company or project-based. And so uh, they would sort of shift with those teams as they moved between different projects, but if there had been three projects done by team A and three projects done by team B, they might actually have fairly different technical implementations for similar functionality. Now, what was really interesting about this is when we started to evaluate the solutions these teams were coming up with, it was actually a real challenge because they all had good solutions. You couldn't look at them and say like, oh, you're really hacking Drupal in some horrifying way. We should not do that in any of these projects. They were just 
They were different, not even for the sake of being different, they were just really trying to optimize their solutions very specifically to the clients that we were working with. And this really does mirror the Drupal community, the open source community, where you might say that different open source CMSs are multiple good solutions to the same problem space. You can't necessarily go hugely wrong by choosing any one of these best of breed software platforms that are out there. Like, I don't know, from a developer perspective, if you're choosing Symfony or Laravel, you might have preferences for each one, but they're both gonna let you get the job done and get the job done well. So was this a problem of communication? Could we solve this by thinking about how we talked and shared information with one another? Well, think about all of the places where we communicate. So I, we are all here, we all have to go to drupal.org to buy our tickets. Um, we have some sense of how that works, but you know, there's issues and all of the work in the Drupal core space, contrib modules that our teams were working with. Um, you know, we uh, used to use IRC. For those of you who've been around forever, there was a system called Freenode that's kind of like Slack for super nerds. And, uh, you know, I mean, I loved it. It was great. But, you know, we had all these decisions and discussions taking place in chat on that system where even out of the box, it didn't have any way to store the history of what those decisions were unless someone made an effort to put them somewhere else. Um, I imagine a lot of you are familiar with Jira. And, you know, Jira is a project that has been around for or a product that's been around for, what, 20 years now? Um, and so, you know, you might have decisions made for your internal work or for your client projects there. Um, of course, we're all familiar with GitHub. You have decisions and communication happening there. Um, and then Freenode actually died if you weren't around for that. Like, it, the ownership completely fell apart. They, there was a huge mess. And like, that entire system of communication is gone. And I couldn't tell you how to easily find a decision that was made that was really important to Drupal core if all it was talked about was in IRC, uh, even though I was like living and breathing that for, I don't know, 10 years. Uh, and then, you know, of course, we've got Confluence for wikis. We've got Slack today. So there's so many different places that we make decisions. So communication, like, if anything, our problem was that we had too much communication, right? Like we had all these different places we could talk to each other, but no place to say, here's where the decision was. So if improving our team communication couldn't let us standardize and simplify, maybe we could do this with documentation. So let's think though about some of the challenges of documentation in technical teams. Uh, this is a real request from a client. Um, we were wrapping up a project with them and they were gonna have this gap where our team was rolling off because we were done our, our time on it, but they didn't have any engineers or developers in house and they wouldn't for several months because of their hiring processes. And so their project managers were then going to be responsible for managing the site. And they were obviously nervous about like what to do if the site stops working. Now, um, you know, this really isn't a documentation problem. The problem was they didn't have the staff to properly support it or they didn't have the budget to hire any sort of agency to do you know, long-term support for them. But just think about all the things that can go wrong during an outage. You know, it could be your hosting provider is down. It could be you tried to do a Drupal upgrade and something broke. It could just be that the internet is having a bad day and packets are going off to you know, nowhere. Uh, it could be that your site is just getting a new bug, it could be a security issue, a DDoS attack, any of these things. And what they wanted was documentation that was understandable and that was there's those non-technical project managers could feel confident they understood what all those steps were so that they could direct future in-house developers. But when it came down to it, this really was a bad documentation request because it didn't have a clear audience. The audience was essentially anyone who might be freaking out because our website is down. Um, and when you have such a large problem space, how do you turn those into actionable next steps? of what to do. You have to kind of be a little bit of an expert to just narrow down where the problems could be. And those steps are not necessarily repeatable or testable. What are you gonna do? Like DDoS your own site so you can practice the steps for bringing it back? I mean, some might, but only if you have those engineers and developers, which they didn't have. And, you know, it was also, they, 
uh, weren't asking for the documentation in a tool fit for the purpose because a lot of those sorts of action items that you might try and write down are tied to the current state of your code. If you upgrade Drupal, if you change a contributed module, if you change a content type, all of those things could change what your steps are. So, you know, in the end, that's where we landed with this. Um, and, you know, we knew that going back to standardize and simplify, we, we were getting this feeling that we needed to do documentation, but we weren't sure how we could avoid these pitfalls. And when we look back, there were actually were prior documentation efforts at Lullabot, but they all kind of sputtered out after two or three months. And uh, it was at least my hypothesis. The reason they did is because we didn't clearly define audience or scope for those documentation. So, like I said, this was early 2021, and uh, I'm from Canada and uh, in Ontario, and everything was locked down that January, and it was really sad because we had beautiful snow. We had heaps and heaps of snow, and all the ski hills were closed. Uh, so I was stuck at home and, you know, needing something to do. Um, I started to set up Home Assistant, which is a home automation tool. It's a lot of fun. A lot, you know, we can talk about that later. But, you know, I had a question about how I could set it up and get it running. Um, and so I'm reading their documentation, which is pretty good. And I found this in the Home Assistant documentation. And I wanted to run it on Ubuntu because that's what my server was already running. And it very clearly said, ah, no, nah, no, nah. there's two supported operating systems. Use one of these two. And I was like, but Debian's, you know, Debian and Ubuntu, they're very similar. Like, maybe I can just make it work the way they want it to. And what was really interesting was they had this make it compliant with ADR0014. And there was no more information, just a link, but I had to click that. Like, you know, what was this? Some upstream standard or something? Um, and that took me to a different GitHub repository that started to blow my mind. Because here we have a record of exactly what they consider to be in a supported installation method for this open source software. And we can see that there's the date the decision was made. We can see a status, which just looking at this implies there must be other kinds of statuses. Otherwise, why would you have everything this thing ex accepted? Um, they had a link to a previous document that explained why they had to make the decision. And then uh, this is just, you know, I've zoomed in a bit here, but uh, this is just the very beginning of it because if you scroll down, it's got all the information about from a technical level what you need to do to have this, um, this, this installation method supported. So I'm, I'm really curious because I'm also thinking about standardize and simplify, standardize and simplify. What are we going to do here? So, uh, you know, I had to walk up a directory. Let's see what else is in here. And uh, we can see uh, there's more of them uh, than this, but we've got some, you know, very clear, like, hey, what's the minimum Python version? Uh, web scraping is a fun one for all the, you know, developers in the audience where they basically ban code that parses HTML. Because they're like, we had so much support problem, so many support problems with it, we're just, we're not doing this anymore. But what's this first one that says record architecture decisions? Well, um, again, this one is actually really short. I've got the entire thing listed here. Um, and it's got a link to, we will use architecture decision records as described by Michael Nygaard. Okay, let's walk this chain one more time. And we get to a blog post. And uh, look at the date on this. Now, I was doing this in 2021. And this was November 2011 when it was published. And this was really fascinating because they were referencing something outside of open source. They were referencing something outside of home automation. And it was nearly a decade old. How many blog posts have been written 10 years ago that are still valuable, right? That are worth linking to, that haven't aged to a point where it's just not worth having anymore. And that's where this line came from. So, you know, when we think about valuable types of documentation, even though it wasn't an architecture decision record, that blog post was really valuable documentation. It was standing the test of time. So, what is an architecture decision record exactly? It's those three headings, really. Context, decision, consequences. You want to document why you need to make the decision. How many times have you had a two hour long group call with team members where you're talking about some issue and you're just thinking in the back of your mind, 
do we even actually need to do this? Like, can we just sidestep this entire problem? Do we need to make a decision now? Well, the context forces you to describe to your reader why the decision was worth making in the first place. And then the decision, what you're actually deciding to do, how to implement it, any references, those sorts of things. And then finally, and this is, I think, really the, the sort of genius of architecture decision records is the consequences. And the consequences can be and should be both the good outcomes and possibly the bad outcomes. What will be helped by making this decision and who will possibly have a harder time because you've made this decision. Um, and it also allows you to look back at those older decisions and see how good you were at predicting the future, right? Um, but there's several things that an architecture decision record is not. So an ADR is not a choose your own adventure. You don't want to be reading through an ADR and left with questions about how to implement the decision, what the decision means. You don't want to have to make any choices in an ADR. It should be very straightforward. Here's the context. Here's the thing to do. Um, you could have debate about uh, an ADR itself as to whether or not it applies to a given situation, but not necessarily once you've determined that it applies, what the action items should be. Um, an ADR should also have a reasonably long life. Uh, we use the, the guideline of months to years at Lullabot because if you are going through the effort of thinking about a decision, writing an ADR, and then you know, two months later, it's no longer worth it, then you've just burned a bunch of time and you're not getting the value of that. It's kind of like automated testing, right? Like you spend weeks or months creating a bunch of automated tests and then you throw them all out because you're changing your website so much. Like the only way you get the real value from them is when you're running those tests for months or years at a time. Um, you know, it's also one of those things where if you expect an ADR to change, then is it really a decision, right? Like you're kind of just masquerading a debate as a decision. And you really are then just thinking about the state of your project, not the, the direction you want to go in. Um, but likewise, technology changes, um, and so can ADRs. Um, ADRs can be updated in place if you don't change the substance of the decision. So for example, in Home Assistant, when they bump their Python version, that is the minimum that's required, they don't go through a whole process of deprecating the old ADR, filing a new one, getting it reviewed. They just change the version number in that. ADR because really that's just going to keep going up over time. You don't want to end up with like a hundred old ADRs just saying, hey, we're on Python 2.8 and now we're on 3.1 or whatever it is. Um, and we use this at Lullabot for decisions where maybe a, a module changed a little bit between say Drupal 9 and Drupal 10 and we might just update the guidance like use this drush command instead of that drush command. Um, but there are times when an ADR is going to be past its prime. You can imagine that if you had a bunch of ADRs, and you could have because this whole system existed just because, you know, I didn't know about it or we didn't know about it in the Drupal community, there was probably somebody out there who has a library of ADRs all about a Drupal 7 website. And you can imagine most of those don't apply when they get that upgraded to modern Drupal. Right? And so that's fine. You can mark them as deprecated. You still leave them accessible, but you change that status so that if someone needs to understand the old historical decisions and context, they can, but if they don't, they just know to skip over it. So, you know, the other part about ADRs is that they don't replace all your documentation. They should only document decisions. They don't replace the README in your GitHub repository. They don't replace your setup instructions for how to get the site up and running. They don't replace uh, test plans or QA plans or anything like that. They don't necessarily teach you anything new. They don't say how to run automated tests on this project or how to pull down the database so that you have a new version of that. Um, you know, it's really about the decisions and then all the work, whether that's tickets or pull requests or however you're managing that, would flow out from that. So this made me wonder, like, are ADRs the battery-powered can opener that's going to let us unstick all of our previous documentation efforts? Is this something that we could bring into Lullabot to 
really solve this problem of standardize and simplify. So we wanted to get started kind of on easy mode. We knew that if we went straight to the most contentious, the most difficult decisions, the ones that our team was not clearly in alignment on, we would stall out and not get anywhere. So um, one of my colleagues, Darren Peterson, came up with this idea of invisible standards. And we call these, or we consider these standards that everyone is doing anyways, without question, but we haven't written down at all. We don't talk about, we just expect. And when we go back to our goals around, say, hiring new developers, this is like the worst kind of standard you can have because they spend their first week working on a project and they do some work and maybe they have some other ideas from previous jobs, previous projects they've been on, and they might clash and they, can you, you know, you don't want to be in a situation where like your first three pull requests are, uh, you know, have lots of needs changes and reviews and so on. You want those people to be successful. So, um, you know, we wanted to, figure out what our invisible standards were and get into the habit of writing ADRs around them because that should theoretically be easy. So uh, here is our first ADR, uh, environment indicator. And this one is all about the environment indicator module. Anyone here, ever, who's here familiar with environment indicator? See, there's almost a standard in this room for using it. Um, so if you're not familiar with it, what it does is it tells you which copy of a site you are working on up in the admin toolbar at the top of the screen. So you can imagine you've got your production website where you might be, if you're, if you're someone who works on content, logged in, making changes, whatever you might be doing there. You might also have a, a dev or a QA server running a copy of your site. You might have a pull request environment, such as through Tugboat or uh, any solution like that where every single change is getting its own dedicated environment. And you don't want to get confused. Like, you know, I've definitely done things like there's a bug report, and so I delete or start changing content with, you know, cat pictures or whatever, and that was on production. That would not be a good day. Um, so, you know, this was something we were already doing on all our projects, and we started to document the decision. And one of the things we want to do, getting back to that, like, don't have any questions, is it shouldn't be install environment indicator and then ask your, your technical lead or your project manager how should we configure it. It should tell you how to do that already. And so we knew the real configuration that was important was what the color schemes were, which uh, in this module you actually configure in settings.php. And here's what we ended up with. But we discovered something interesting and, and kind of horrifying as we were talking to our teams about what they had. Some of our teams had red as live, like we've got here, and gray as your local environment. Some of our teams had them reversed, where gray was live and red was local. Like, and can you imagine you're changing projects and you think you're on your local and you screw something up? Like, that's really a challenge. Um, we also discovered that uh, our colors actually failed accessibility contrast checks based off of the size of the text that Environment Indicator was using for the words that would say whether you were live or dev or whatever environment that you had. And so we were able to do the work, figure out what made the most sense, standardize on that. We even contributed some upstream uh, documentation changes uh, where we saw that there were also other examples, Environment Indicator failing accessibility checks. And then, you know, in the ADR, um, you know, we have this copy and paste snippet that's just like, throw this into your settings file and you know you're following it along uh, with all of those different environments. And it really turned this from a decision, from a debate, from a discussion into something you don't have to think about. If you're kicking off a brand new Drupal site or you've inherited a project that you're doing a rebuild on, You've all of a sudden got like your first week or first two weeks of tickets sorted out and you can just knock through them one after the other, depending on how many of these ADRs actually apply to your given project. So uh, where are we at right now? 
Um, this is the homepage of architecture.lullabot.com. You can go to that. It's a completely public website. All of the content on it is licensed under the Creative, uh, Creative Commons 4.0 license. You can even download the Markdown source files and use them in your own projects. And the majority of our engineering team uh, has taken part in at least one ADR, which is, I think, something that's really neat to see. Um, let's take a look at another example of an ADR. Um, probably won't give me a hand. Who's familiar with the simple add more module? Yeah, but you work at Lullaby or work with us. It's not the, quite the same. Um, but uh, this is a module one of my coworkers created, which helps improve the user interface of cardinality uh, fields, anything that has like uh, a set number of values. And it's pretty great because there's literally no configuration. You just download and install it. So in the ADR, we don't have to say how to configure it. It's just turn it on and you're good to go. Um, one of the reasons I wanted to highlight this uh, ADR is that we added an alternatives considered section, right? What did we think about and decide not to do? And uh, in this case, there's actually a, a Drupal core issue that has sort of the same goal, same type of implementation, um, but it's using client-side JS instead of doing it server-side. Oh, no, sorry, I've got that backwards. Um, the, yes, the solution that is in the module uses client-side JS, and I think core maybe doesn't. But anyways, the point doesn't really matter. Um, what's important about this is we've got a breadcrumb as to what would make this ADR not valid in the future. That issue that we're linking to gets merged, then we can deprecate this once we know our sites are updated to the latest version of Drupal. And in this case, we don't have any bad consequences. And uh, you know, luckily, I mean, we've had this ADR for a while now, and there haven't been any, but it's also because it's pretty simple. So it turns out that the answer to that question of is this a documentation problem or a communication problem, like all good engineering problems, the answer was both. Um, so, you know, in practice, most of our ADRs start in Slack, which I think most of us are familiar with. So, you know, in Slack, we're having lots of sentences, timely responses. I have a problem right now and would really like an answer in the next hour if possible. Um, and Slack is also one of those mediums where it's kind of okay to lose the conversation in the back scroll. Um, you know, if you work at a larger organization and you take two weeks off, you're not going to read every single Slack message that was posted. That's just asking for a, a bad way to get back. Um, but when these conversations happen, they usually don't start out by saying, oh, I've got an idea for an ADR. They usually start out with, I have a problem, can someone help me with it, or I'm working on this task. But once they grow, once people start to you know, press shift enter and use paragraphs and it becomes a real discussion, um, we now use uh, Discourse, which is an open source forum software. You can self-host it, but we are, we are happily paying for the hosted version because it's exactly the same as the uh, self-hosted code, and we like to support companies that do open source that way. And they have a plugin for Slack that lets you take a thread or a range of messages and push them to a discussion in your discourse instance, which is great because we can then, when we see those discussions, when they get to that point where it's like, oh, if someone's on vacation and they should probably read this and catch up, it makes it a lot easier for them to do by going to that, that site. So they grow and we push that over. And then as we you know, have those discussions, um, we use GitHub issues specifically for, you know, there's a task to do. Like we have decided to write the ADR someone needs to do it. Um, or there is a, you know, a change to an existing ADR that we, we need to make. So uh, let's take a look at a couple of examples of you know, some of those discussions. So like here, uh, Andy at Lullabot, he asked, uh, he didn't even ask a question, he's just like, hey, Storybook has default telemetry on. What do we think about that? 
And we had a conversation about what that meant, but then we realized again, like this is bigger than just storybook, right? Like I think Yarn has default on telemetry. I know Gatsby does. Um, you know, a lot of the, sort of the more JS tools are starting to do that. And regardless of your position as to whether or not that's an okay thing to do, it's still a discussion to have. In this case, we did realize that we couldn't necessarily have an ADR that described if we would universally opt in or out of telemetry. Because what if it's an open source project where they are publishing all of their telemetry for the benefit of the community? What about Drupal.org data, right? You know, modules installed, all of that. And so because it was something that really was more of a case-by-case -case basis, uh, you know, we didn't make a decision and that's fine. You know, the cheapest decisions to make are the ones that you decide, hey, we can put this discussion to bed for a while and come back and reevaluate it. Um, but because it's in discuss, if two years from now, uh, you know, Next.js does something awful with telemetry and people are really wondering what our policy is, they can at least search in discuss and hopefully find this thread. Uh, here's another one where uh, some of our projects were using NPM for JavaScript package management, some were using Yarn, and I was doing an investigation on it for a client, and you know, I was like, hey, should we use both? Should we not use them? Like, you know, is it project specific? And uh, again, we didn't really come up with a final decision on this. We determined there was too many variables in place to be able to standardize on one tool or the other. But uh, here is an ADR that actually was accepted, an example of an issue. So, you know, we always try to link back and forth. Uh, if you are familiar with Drupal's multilingual UI, um, one of the things that it does is that by default it shows a drop down with the language switcher. Of, and I'm sorry, it's not the language switcher for like what site uh, language am I using, it's for what this piece of content is. And we kept discovering that uh, our clients, our editors, would go to translate a page, but they wouldn't go to the list of languages and click the link that says add a translation for French or whatever language. They would just edit the English version, delete all the content, and then put in their translated copy and change that drop down from English to French or whatever language they were using, which meant they were losing that page and that uh, you know, caused a lot of pain. And so, uh, you know, this is something we realized that whenever we're doing a translated website, we really need to, to fix this. And so, you know, we had this uh, uh, discussion, we described what needed to be done, and you can find the ADR on architecture.lullabot.com right now. Um, so to accept a Lullabot ADR, we have a couple of guidelines for that. One is, we don't document what is already a default in upstream software or communities. You know, if it's Drupal coding standards, for example, there's no point for us to say, hey, we use those, because everyone should be using those. We don't want to duplicate uh, documentation that is well written that exists elsewhere. Um, we also expect our decisions to be able to be written as a single title. And our guideline for that is if someone is an expert in the domain that the ADR is written in, they should be able to read just the title and nothing else and be able to implement that decision. So for example, we have a bunch of ADRs around Composer. There's a, an ADR that says uh, when you use the Composer patches plugin, always include the patches references inline in composer.json, never use a separate file. And I don't have the title right there, but you know, if you understand Composer, if you've used Composer patches, even again, if you don't necessarily agree with that as a new Lullabot employee or team member, you can read that one line and go on to the ADRs that you maybe don't understand immediately. Um, we also expect any ADRs that we accept to be in effect for at least one year. And we actually have a, another guideline that once we accept an ADR, we are going to stick with it for at least three months. We haven't yet run into a situation where we've accepted an ADR and like two weeks later had real you know, choice regret about what, you know, what we've done. Um, but our thinking is that if we've gone through all this effort, if the team has agreed that an ADR is the way to go, it could just be a, 
a problem on the project, right? It could be something very specific that causes it to, to not work in that one case. And we need to give an ADR at least, you know, a second or a third time to realize that we've made a mistake. But maybe we'll never need to do that. I mean, I'm sure it'll happen at some point, but we'll see. Um, and then likewise, an ADR needs to be a baseline for all projects that we start or inherit. And what I mean by that is we are very collaborative with our clients. We do work in agreement with them, uh, you know, at a sprint level, on a ticket level, however we're running the project. But uh, these are decisions that we will implement without asking the client, right? Like they get environment indicator. It just shows up. We don't ask them, hey, is that worth putting into a sprint? It means these are decisions that are so key to our work that if we have to do it uh, as unbilled time, we will do it because it saves us so much in terms of team consistency over the long run. Um, a Lullabot ADR is also a list of deciders. We include the names of every team member who participated in Slack discussions, discuss discussions, phone calls, anything like that, so that if five years from now someone thinks that there's some missing context or they have questions about an ADR, there's a hopefully at least someone who has that background that they can reach out to. And honestly, we want to be clear that this is not, you know, me, Andrew Berry, Director of Technology, making decisions. This is really, you know, about laying out the framework for how we make the decisions, but then empowering the team to do that together. Um, our ADRs are written in Markdown and stored in Git, and they're rendered with a Gatsby theme plugin that one of my colleagues put together, and they're released under a Creative Commons license. Uh, you know, these four items may be different for you, for your project, your team, your company. You may decide that your flavor of an ADR is different, and that's fine. You know, a lot of these, like, I do think Markdown and Git is a good way to go, but you know, I don't know if we, we, we probably, and we might use Next.js if we were starting a new implementation of the front end or, you know, maybe you're like, oh, we'll just do a Drupal site. Like, that's fine. You know, you want to do something that works, not something that uh, ends up being a project on itself. So I gave a version of this presentation in 2021 and I uh, gave, had these next steps uh, for, you know, goals for the, the year. And uh, you know, at the time, we hadn't implemented discourse, so we did. Um, we wanted to make the ADRs public, and we did, and we wanted to move on to documenting decisions for higher cost problems, we did. I think probably one of the uh, most in-depth decisions we made was around local environments. Um, at Lullabot, we very much believe in people using the tools that they feel make them empowered and the most efficient, and that meant for I don't know, until I guess 2021, 2022, we didn't have a standard local development environment. It was do what works best on your operating system, your way of working. Um, so we had a working group and that working group concluded that we should standardize on DDEV for local environments and we documented that as an ADR. Um, and using ADRs on client projects, which we have, where you have to make a project specific decision. Is this site using Layout Builder or Layout Paragraphs or some other way to do landing pages, uh, is this site, uh, how is this site handling multilingual or menu management or any of those sorts of things. But again, those should be things that are specific just as we don't want to duplicate the open source communities documentation best practices in Lullabot ADRs, we don't want to duplicate Lullabot ADRs in client projects. So moving ahead to 2023. Um, I think these numbers are probably stale now, um, but we have 30, at least 35 accepted ADRs. We have two or maybe three deprecated ADRs, many, many participants. Um, we have ADRs in place on client projects. We reference our public ADRs in sales proposals and upstream issues as a way to say, hey, this bug fix is important. Our team is standardized on your software in this way, and you know, this is how it affects us. Or, or when a sales proposal asks for technical details about how we implement a Drupal site, often we can reference those ADRs. Um, ADRs have been conceived and moved fully through the process without manager involvement. Um, at Lullabot, you get a sabbatical at 10 years, which is basically uh, an extra month of vacation. I took mine this summer and it was wonderful. And in that time, an entire ADR happened. I came back to work and like the discussion, the genesis, all the way through to being approved and merged was, was done. And I was really excited to see the team take the lead that way. Um, and, you know, there have been some 
considerations on using ADRs in the broader Drupal community. There was a, a great blog post about decision record keeping in the schema.org blueprints module. And uh, you know, it was neat to see sort of other people taking this idea and run with it. So uh, you know, we've got a couple of things we need to work on. We need to deal with our backlog. We've got like 30 open issues on GitHub right now. Some of them are probably 18 months old. And you know, that I, I need to like do some gardening there. Um, we had a slowdown after the initial burst of ADRs. We're getting a new one in probably every two to three months. And we don't have any, as many public ADRs on front-end decisions. And that could be because it's harder to standardize the front-end because our, the designs are you know, bespoke and unique and there's a lot that you can't necessarily standardize on. Or maybe it reflects a bias in the way we are managing and directing our teams that's pushing them more towards you know, back-end focus instead of front-end focus and that's something to work on. Um, so perhaps you see this. This could be a way to get involved in a Drupal project, even if you're not a coder, right? Um, you know, I think some of these have already happened, but you know, maybe there's a community or a contrib project you're working on where you're making decisions right here, right now, that are of architectural significance. Nothing stops you from throwing a markdown file in a doc slash ADR folder in your Drupal project containing these. Um, but you may be wondering how to get started. So really, just start writing. You know, the act of writing an ADR, often by the time you get to the end of it, you're like, oh, this is a really bad idea. Let's go back and rethink things. But the act of writing, it can really help crystallize your decision making. Um, probably just use Markdown in Git because it's what we all use for our day-to-day -day work. Your developers will be much happier using that and work participating in the decision process than using a tool like Confluence. Um, and it's okay to take your time. Like, really, you know, some of our ADRs, they take two or three months to get to that end state, and that's okay because we want to make sure we're making the right decision well, not the wrong decision fast. So uh, I'd like to thank everyone for attending. Uh, I'll leave you with this uh, last ADR, but otherwise, I think uh, we can open it up for questions. So thank you. Um, I don't know if you can hear me. Yeah. So there's one question. As a decision is only as good um, as the knowledge and facts at the time, how do you decide when an ADR is ready for review and see if it's still valid? So you, when you're thinking about um, ADRs that have already been published, um, usually the way that happens is because we're constantly implementing these ADRs on our projects because it's a baseline, there's a natural review process happening there where, you know, especially as it was happening with our Drupal 9 to Drupal 10 upgrades, for example, there was some changes in our Drupal deployment steps. I think there might have been one or two changes in the Composer um, uh, ADRs. So, you know, the best way to review your ADRs is to use them, to keep them front of mind. If, you know, you write them and then no one is thinking about them using them on your projects, then they are going to go stale. It's going to feel like a chore when you have to review them and it's going to rapidly lead to your repository going to an archive state. There might be. I see. Um, what was the biggest challenge to getting this process implemented? Yeah, um, I'll, I'll say two challenges. Um, well, no, so like the biggest challenge from the process side was really getting the team used to the idea that we make decisions together and sort of coming to terms with losing a little bit of autonomy that way, right? Like, that's just something that we had baked into our culture. And, uh, you know, I don't think this would have worked if we had had a small group of people making all of the decisions. We needed to give people a voice, but then make it so that they felt like they were involved and listened to and considered, so that even if a decision didn't go the way that they would have preferred, they feel like they are supporting the rest of their team in those decisions, right? Like, it may, make, you know, in those consequences, a decision may make my life a little bit harder. But if it makes things easier for another 20 engineers on the team, then that is a good decision to make for, for the health of your, your team and your project. Um, I'll also say, you know, one thing that's a little bit different that happened at Lullabot during this period of time is we became an ESOP, which is a form of employee ownership. And 
th I think that also really was pushing people towards this mindset of what we are doing is both good for the company as a whole and good for me because if we can make all our projects better, that will pay off for every employee in the long run. Um, and how do you, you know if there's already an existing ADR for current problems, um, if there are hundreds of, ADR, hundreds of ADRs? There's a search box at the top of the ADR website. <laughs> uh, highly recommend using it. Um, and also because it's in Git, like, you know, if you're a super nerd like I am, you can just run git grep something and you'll probably find it. Um, and how do you measure success, velocity, adoption, number of participants? Yeah, um, I mean, I think the, the biggest risk that I saw is that we would make decisions and then those decisions would grind our projects to a halt, right? What if we had a bunch of onboarding ADRs and all of a sudden it was adding six weeks of development to every project that we weren't really considering? So I would say our success is measured in the fact that that hasn't happened, that it's improved our, you know, per project velocity that way. Um, and yeah, you know, for me, it's like, the success is not the fact that we created an initial library of ADRs, but it's that the team is, you know, working on them, that many in the team are proposing them. I mean, even people from our strategy and design teams are involved and sometimes have proposed ADRs for things around editorial experience. And so, to me at least, I think that's a really good marker of, you know, success and collaboration. Thanks. Um, and what other documentation are you creating and how do these other types of documentation work with ADRs? Yeah, so I mean, from a technical level, most of our documentation ends up being markdown files in GitHub, and so they're easy to link to, easy to reference one way or another. Um, we will reference the ADRs in client tickets. You know, we are doing this because of this decision. Um, you know, I would say that some of our projects do have internal wikis, Confluence, uh, SharePoint, you know, whatever they're using. But one of our reasons for making the bulk of our ADRs public is because then we can reference them from internal private tools, right? We didn't want to leave our clients in the dark about why we made a decision if they were taking maintenance or a development of their site in-house. Cool, makes sense, yeah. Um, and, I mean, two more questions, but they're very similar. Um, is there an ultimate decision maker if devs can't agree on a single decision um, and if there's no consensus, do you put, step, put your foot down, essentially? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And so we do have a couple of team members who have volunteered to be maintainers of ADRs. And we have some who have back-end expertise, some who have front-end expertise. Um, you know, they, their, their role, and honestly my role, is less around putting our foot down and more about unblocking decisions, right? So, you know, if you see a lot of back and forth in, uh, dis dis in our discuss forum, for example, we will say, hey, we're gonna put our foot down, not in a, we're gonna stop this conversation. We need to actually like have a synchronous call, do a Zoom chat or do Zoom call or something like that. Um, I will say that because we have this heuristic that it needs to apply to all of our projects, we do do a lot of checking with our support team to make sure that we're not making decisions that they feel like they would have to undo. So they are equal and valid participants and I think that really helps um, you know, ensure that the decisions we make are valid for a project over the whole life cycle. Yep. Thank you. Okay. I don't even know how to write this question. So, <laughs> so uh, this seems to be mostly, the examples you mentioned are like uh, linear things but that happen in every project, the ADRs that you, the examples, but I can think more of things where you find a problem that recurs in every second project at some point and then con based on some condition you need to make some choice and then you still want to uh, write it down maybe. Right. But it's not so simple. So in those cases we try to include the condition in the title, right? So, you know, for example, if you're doing a project that um, is Next.js, you're not using Composer. Those decisions don't apply. We have tags on all of our ADRs, so you can filter them. If you want to say, I want to know everything related to JavaScript or DevOps or Drupal, uh, you can filter that list down fairly easily to get what you're looking at. But if it's something that's every other project, if those projects have the same technical base, then that means it's not ready for an ADR, 
right? That means we would probably stop at the discussion level and have there the heuristics for how different teams made different decisions. Okay. Another question maybe, uh, sometimes you have this um, problem solution thing and you, when you search, you only know the problem, but you don't know the solution. And the idea, our title would be the solution and not the problem. So the, I was thinking there should be some separate thing where you record the, quest, the problem in one place and the solution linked mm. in another place. Or something. So the, the ADR title is the summary of the decision, not necessarily the problem or the solution, if that makes sense. So like, if the problem is um, Drupal.org is down for maintenance and you can't run builds because all of your patches are referencing git.drupal.org, like that's your problem, right? But the decision is, is, you know, always download the patch, put it in your local repository, and that just happens to be the solution. So because we have search, right, if you search for patches or drupal.org or composer, you're going to find that because we are indexing more than just the title. We're indexing the whole thing. Does that wrap us up? Or? I think that's everything. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank well, much. thanks everyone. Uh, feel free to come on up and uh, it's glad to see everyone here.